Outstanding effort again. We're busting ours to kick yours. That's big time. Minus 15. Respect all, fear none. Oh, did he belt that one? Intensity is not a perfume. It was a no doubter. Five, four, three, two, one. We are up in the bird's nest here at Oriole Park at Camden Yards. I'm Brendan Mortensen alongside Matt Bonaparte. Bones, we are just a day away from opening day. Very exciting to have baseball season back. But do just want to start with the fact that it has been a tough 24 hours in the Baltimore community. Obviously, with the tragic accident and collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge yesterday, the Orioles were supposed to have an open workout to the fans to to show off some new stuff that was happening in the ballpark and obviously much more important things going on in the community. So we wanted to share our thoughts and condolences with those lost, with friends, with families, with, you know, frontline service workers, with, with everybody uh, involved and just with the community in general that is grieving right now after a really tragic accident yesterday. You know, very fortunate to the first responders that were able to limit traffic on the bridge, you know, limit um, the lives lost and the damage yesterday, but obviously still a very tough 24 hours here in Baltimore, and it, and it feels difficult to talk about baseball without first acknowledging the fact that, yeah, this has been uh, a, a difficult stretch for the community. Yeah, like you said, uh, we're thinking about those people, and the players were as well yesterday. Yep. We talked to them. Uh, a lot of those guys were answering questions about it, saying, you know, they couldn't fathom losing a loved one. So Yeah. Yeah, so again, our, our thoughts and condolences to to those lost, to friends, to family, to just community members in general that are grieving in the Baltimore area. But an important thing, you know, the baseball is not the most important thing right now, but an important thing that was mentioned yesterday by guys like Gunnar Henderson, Cedric Mullins, players who were, were talking about the tragedy yesterday, saying that, you know, baseball's not all that important in the grand scheme of things, but no. when something like this happens to a community, to a city like Baltimore, baseball can be something that can bring people together. You know, opening day is still an exciting thing. Baltimore is still excited for baseball to be back, and I think now, even more so, it'll be something that the community is able to rally around, and we're going to have baseball here at Camden Yards in a day, and and that's really cool. And I'm excited to see this team play. Yeah. It's going to be pretty cool. Yeah, and, and we have some baseball to talk about just as the players are excited to get back and have something for the community to rally around here. We are excited to have baseball back at Camden Yards as well. So let's kind of start here with the unofficial opening day roster. The Orioles have not made that official yet, but based on some roster moves, we are able to kind of sparse together what the journey is what, excuse me, what the opening day roster is going to look like here. So we'll start with the catchers. Adley and James McCann, those were givens. There wasn't really much of a chance that there would be a third catcher. Those are going to be your two this season. In the infield, you've got Gunnar Henderson, Jordan Westberg, Ramon Arias, Jorge Mateo, and a newcomer, Tony Kemp. Tony Kemp? One of your guys, Bones. Uh, Sure. I love a good ball player, and that's what Tony Kemp is. I mean, he's... Cut from the same cloth as Rugnet Odor and Adam Frazier. And guess what number he's wearing, Brendan? Ball player number. He's wearing 12. He's wearing a ball okay? player number. You know, so he's, he's, he's going to fit that role for the O's and uh, be one of those guys who can play really solid defense. I think what probably led to this decision a little bit were his splits last year. He was yep. really good against left-handed pitching, albeit just 64 plate appearances, but an average above 300, OPS around 900. So you got to love that from Tony Kemp. Uh, and that's probably what they're looking to add uh, with no Jackson Holiday making the opening day roster. Tony Kemp slides in that into that spot. Yeah, Tony Kemp was excellent offensively two seasons ago. Had an OPS of 800, batting average up near 280. Like you said, he's going to play a solid defensive second base, which <clears> is something that the Orioles mentioned. They're waiting on Jackson Holiday a little bit. It's a yeah. brand new position for him, and Tony Kemp is no stranger to second base. He has probably one of my favorite highlights of all time. Sure. The the sprawling catch at second base where Tony Kemp was probably more surprised than anybody that he made the catch and uh, comes up and is like, face is just like, oh my God, I can't believe I made that catch. Very cool highlight if you haven't seen it. But Tony Kemp figures to be a solid depth utility piece on this roster. Can play some outfield as well. Probably not going to give you a ton with the bat, but as you mentioned, the splits last year against left-handed pitching were really good. 
and the splits for his career are relatively even against right and left-handed pitching. Yeah. So somebody needs an off day. You can work Tony Kemp in there. I can't imagine he's going to start too many games, but a solid rotational sort yeah, of Yeah, I don't think there. he breaks the starting infield. I think you're still going to see Westberg at second, Arias at third, and Henderson at short. Yeah. Uh, but he'll be a nice guy to fall back on knowing you have defense, knowing that there is a bat there. Uh, so not the worst option in the world. Yeah, Brandon Hyde mentioning a week or so ago that Gunnar Henderson was going to be playing shortstop a majority of the time, which, as you mentioned, probably for opening day, slots Gunnar at shortstop, Jordan Westberg at second base, and Ramon Arias at third, if we had to guess. Yeah. Moving into the outfield, Cedric Mullins, Austin Hayes, Anthony Santander, those were the givens, and Colton Kowser wins the outfield competition. He will be the fourth outfielder on this team after just a spectacular spring. I got to say, being in the clubhouse yesterday, it just felt right that Colton yeah. Kowser was there, that he was on the team. It just felt right. He's a big leaguer in my mind now. He yeah. just is. Uh, the guy's huge, and he has a massive beard. That probably helps his case in my mind. The beard rules. The beard rules. It I does. think he should get some kind of beard wash, like, yeah. uh, sponsor or something like that, because... It's a big beard. And he's starting to get a little, like, handlebar yeah, on like the mustache he's got, a little bit over the beard. I don't think he's touched that thing in a long time. I like, can't imagine so. He's just I don't know how grow. long that's taken him to grow out. but I should ask him that. I'm actually should. pretty curious. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, but he's he had an incredible spring. Yeah. And it all started with a walk-off home run, one of the first games. Uh, he, he was fantastic. And, you know, it's interesting because we went into spring training – thinking Kerstad kind of had the leg up, having yep. been on the postseason roster, was there at the end of the season. They didn't give Kowser a second chance after he struggled a little bit midseason. Uh, but he comes in to spring, and I think this was just a true battle. Whoever plays better is going to get yeah. the spot. doesn't hurt that Kowser can play all three outfield positions, as we've talked about ad nauseum. Um, yeah, Kowser excited uh, to see him on the team. Yeah, there were a few things, but that's a good point. It does feel like this was truly an outfield competition. Yeah. Because Heston Kerstad, as you mentioned, was on the postseason roster a year ago, showed you some really great flashes at the big league level. Colton Kowser did not, but he gave you more value defensively, and it truly did seem like whoever played better in the spring got the spot. And that ends up being Colton Kowser. Six home runs, hit over 300, slugged over 700. In spring training, the OPS was over 1,100. Babe Ruth numbers. Yeah, Babe Ruth numbers. That'll that'll play. And Colton Kowser becomes your fourth outfielder. It'll be interesting to see how true that fourth outfielder role really is. We could yeah. see Kowser potentially starting some games in right field as he's probably an upgrade defensively over Anthony Santander in that spot. If say. Santander is DHing, and then maybe that moves around Mount Castle and O'Hearn at first base in DH. So... I don't know if Kowser is going to be a true fourth outfielder in that if one of the three guys needs an off day, then Colton Kowser plays, or if we'll see him a little bit more regularly. I think they're going to want to get him in the fold, right? I mean, yes, this is a guy a top 20 who, prospect in baseball. Yeah, he's a fantastic player, a great talent. And, you know, we've seen him struggle at every, every time he jumps a level, which is entirely normal. Uh, and he straightens it out and ends up mashing. So I think that, you know, they know that better than us, the front office and, and Brandon Hyde. So they're going to want to uh, get him some at-bats, let him get out of those growing pains and whatnot too. So I could see him, like you said, getting some time if Santander is DHing or something like that to get all four of those bats in the lineup. Right. Um, here's a question. Just here's looking, an answer. Looking at this outfield, you've got Mullins, Hayes, Santander, and Kowser. Are they the, is that the best outfield in the AL East? It's certainly up there. I mean, with the Yankees, you've got two you've got Judge and Soto. MVP candidates yes, in Judge very, and Soto. very, very good. And Alex Verdugo. It's probably hard to beat the Yankees He's on not paper. a slouch. Yeah. But look, they're right up there. I think they're better than the Red Sox. I think they're better than the Blue Jays. I think they're, they're in second, probably, to the Yankees. I think... If you're looking at the outfield in its totality, I would put the Orioles up. Yeah, with, anybody. with defense. Consider. Add in Colton Kowser as your fourth outfielder. You know, somebody like Kyle Stowers or Heston Kerstad potentially as your fifth outfielder down yeah. the line. I would put that group of four or five up against anybody. Up against anybody. I think the Yankees' top three is hard to beat just because you have yeah. Judge and, and they Soto. And have Trent Grisham on the bench. That probably helps their defense. Right. But the O's, the O's have put themselves in the conversation of best. Anywhere on the roster. They are in the conversation everywhere, I think. Yeah. If you look at from rotation, if they're all healthy especially, but from rotation down to the bench, I think that they're in the conversation for best in the league, whatever, 
in every single spot. Yeah, they, they are certainly right up there. The starting rotation is set. We kind of knew it would be set, but that was the formality there. Corbin Burns, Grayson Rodriguez, Tyler Wells is actually going to start the third game of yeah. this Angel series, which I thought was kind of interesting over Dean Kramer. But look, Tyler Wells was spectacular in the first half of last season. It's entirely possible that if there weren't injuries to Bradish and Means, that fifth starter competition would have been more of a competition than we were anticipating between Tyler Wells and Dean Kramer. Or it just could be a, hey, we like how these lineups work yeah, out sort of deal. Say, Don't want to read a ton into it, people, but yeah, that's think, the five. I think we tend to read into the opening day stuff a ton when really it's just the series. Yeah. We think Wells matches up well against you, but I mean, maybe that's not the case. Um, Who knows? But yeah, I think uh, Kramer as your four is it, it's the sign of a really solid rotation. Yep. Um, solid pitcher at the end of the season last year. He was pretty darn good. Uh, I like Dean Kramer a lot. And, and Wells, I cannot wait to see what the Orioles have in Tyler Wells because he played so well in the first, pun intended, by the way. He played so well in the good first work. half of the season. Uh, arm fatigue hit him. I'm excited to see what kind of player he'll be in the rotation for them. Yeah, absolutely. Cole Irvin rounds out that starting rotation as well. The bullpen, I think there were five that were pretty set, as we had talked about before. And Craig Kimbrell, Yenier Cano, CNL Perez, Danny Coulomb, Dylan Tate. Three spots seemed like they were up for grabs. Yeah. They go to Keegan Aiken, Mike Bauman, Jacob Webb, presumably. Again, this is not an official opening day roster, but based on the recent roster moves, this is what it's looking like. Yeah. Jacob Webb, Mike Bauman, Keegan Aiken take those spots. Bauman played incredibly well in spring training. I'm yep. excited for his season. Had a really just fun baseball reference page look back season with his 10 wins. Yeah. Like that, you'll just look stat. back on that in 10 years. Like he had 10 wins that yeah. year. Um, that was cool. And uh, yeah, Keegan Aiken making his way back in, getting that lefty spot. He was battling with a couple of guys for that. Yeah. Whether it was Nick Vespi or Bruce Zimmerman, he, Keegan Aiken comes out on top. He could throw strikes, uh, which is huge. Um, yeah. I mean, I think the bullpen with, you know, Jacob Webb as well, you get a guy who like, and McDonald has called him all year last year, every day Jacob every day Webb, because he goes out there and he can take the ball every day, yep. uh, which is invaluable in a bullpen arm. So I think that they have a lot of great pieces in the bullpen. Yeah, absolutely. And Keegan Aiken makes sense as a lefty, kind of supplanting Cole Irvin a little bit in a role where maybe Aiken gives you two or three innings yeah. rather than just one, which is something that Cole Irvin could have done for you if he started the season in the bullpen. But that looks like the opening day 26 for opening day tomorrow which means the Jackson Holiday, Heston Kerstad, Kyle Stowers will start the season in AAA. I think Kerstad and Stowers, we don't need to touch on too much. We knew that was going to be a competition with Colton Kowser and Ryan McKenna, and Colton Kowser ends up winning that competition. So two prospects in Kerstad and Stowers that still have a lot of promise are going to start the season down in the minors. The Jackson Holiday move is obviously one that fans reacted to because you want to see the number one prospect in baseball on this team, we are going to see him sooner rather than later, I think. First thing to keep in mind here, it, you made this point with another roster move, Bones, is that Brandon Hyde and Mike Elias know more than we do, and they have not given us any reason over the past few seasons to doubt moves that they are making. And you can have as many questions as you want about how well Jackson Holiday played in spring training and whether or not he was deserving of that second base role. He had teammates saying that he looked ready. I think Jackson Holiday looks ready. He looks like he will be a very solid big leaguer for a lot of years. But the two things that Mike Elias pointed out that they are hoping that Jackson Holiday improves on are getting some more reps against left-handed pitching. Because, again, if you want to nitpick Jackson Holiday, which is very difficult to do as he was spectacular all spring, if you want to nitpick him a little bit, he had 14 at-bats against lefties in spring training, nine strikeouts, just two hits, one double, one home run, 629 OPS aided by those two extra base hits. Nine strikeouts and 14 at-bats against lefties is a lot of strikeouts. It It, it is. Yes. So Jackson Holiday, as well as he played, could have looked better against high-quality left-handed pitching in spring training. Absolutely. And he is adjusting to a relatively new position at second base. Yes, shortstop is probably the position that is valued more defensively, is viewed as the more difficult position to play. Second base, you're going to the other side of the bag. A lot of motions are going to be the other side. It's it's more 
footwork and more intricacies than I think most people realize to make the transition from shortstop over to second base. None of what I am saying here is meant to be any sort of indictment on Jackson Holiday. He was spectacular in spring training. He did everything he could have to put himself in a good position to make this team. It was clearly a very difficult decision for Michael Elias and Brandon Hyde. My takeaway is just that I am going to trust Michael Elias and Brandon Hyde until they give us a reason not to, which they have not done. Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, people want to see him in the big leagues and whatnot, and I think, you know, probably Michael Elias does too. Like, everybody wants to see him in the big leagues. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you also have a team, and, and, like, I get that, but just putting it all on paper, you also have a team that without him won 101 games, and you have 90-however percent right. of those guys coming back. Yeah, he's going to be a great addition to this team when he comes up, but I think that they're looking at this saying, why not give him some more time to be seasoned? You have that luxury. Give him a couple of days down there, a couple of games, whatever, how many series you need, and then bring him up when you think he's ready. And you're fully sure. You want to be sure about this. You want you don't want him to come up and be blindsided and struggle, and then you have a whole other ordeal on your hands. Just have him come up when you think when you know he's ready. Yeah, and just bring him up. And when he is up, he is more than likely going to be an everyday player. And you wouldn't want to be in a situation early on in the season where it feels like you have to platoon Jackson Holiday against yes. left-handed pitching. You don't want to throw him out there if he's only going to give you a 200 on base percentage against yeah. left-handed pitching. So hopefully in AAA, Holiday gets some reps against some high-quality lefty arms, which is hard to do because a lot of high-quality lefty arms are in the big leagues and not in AAA. But we're going to see Jackson Holiday get some more seasoning. He did not have a lot of games with the Tide last year. And we're going to see him soon. I, yeah. I am not worried about Jackson Holiday in the slightest. Bones, let's move on to some, not awards, some categories, some pick okay. if you will, about the 2024 Orioles season. I have come up with some categories of, you know, most home runs, best ERA, most valuable Oriole, things like that. We're going to run through these and give our votes for who we think is going to lead in these categories. Let's start with best starting pitcher ERA. I feel like this one is a relatively obvious choice. Some of them are relatively obvious choices, but there are still categories that I want to run through. I feel like the answer here has probably got to be Corbin Burns. Think of Kyle Bradish was healthy at the beginning of the season. He would certainly be in that conversation, but we saw Burns with a 3.39 ERA in a down year yeah. last year because his previous three seasons, he had a, 294, a 243, and a 211. I'm Hard going not with to Corbin pick Burns. Burns here. Yeah. Really difficult to make any other selection. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, I think it's probably Corbin Burns. I mean, you you could maybe go with Bradish if you think he's going to come back. Sure. Uh, and like the world on fire, which he very well might do. Um, but, yeah, I'll go Burns with you just to be safe. I mean, pick the guy that won the Cy Young just a couple of seasons ago. Uh, I'm excited to see this guy pitch. I yeah. really am. Just being around him in the clubhouse, he just seems like a cool guy. And, cool dude. You know, if you were, if you could choose any athlete to be, you know, like in sports, I think I would choose to be a starting pitcher. I thought you were going to – wow. Okay. I'd love to just go out there and shove sure. against any lineup. And, you know, Corbin Burns gets to live my dream. Yeah, I'd love to have a 97-mile-an-hour cutter. That would be awesome. That I just – kind of came up with on accident because my fastballs kept cutting. Yeah, I think Corbin Burns is the obvious answer. Let's move on to reliever ERA. I think this one is a much more interesting conversation. You've got some solid candidates of returners. Yenier Cano at a 2.11 ERA last year, but wasn't as dominant in the second half. Danny Coulomb was down at 2.81. Craig yep. Kimbrell, the newcomer, was an all-star in 2023. Who gets your vote here, Bones? You know, this is a tough one. It's because a there are a lot of talented arms in there, and you don't know necessarily exactly what kind of roles everybody's going to play. We can have all our projections we want. Obviously, Craig Kimbrell's going to close the games, and you're right. probably going to see Yen Yurkano in the eighth. But other than that, you know, it's pretty rough in terms of roles and whatnot. But I'm going to go Yen Yurkano. Okay. And the reason I will is because he doesn't have the pressure of having to close, which is something before the signing of Craig Kimbrell we thought he might have to do. Yeah. Because... He emerged as one of the best relievers in baseball last season out of nowhere, seemingly nowhere. Uh, and when Felix went down, he was the obvious choice to close, and he did a fine job. But getting Craig Kimbrell is certainly going to help. 
Uh, in the eighth last year, Cano had a 1.83 ERA, only eight earned runs in 39 and a third innings pitched. Yeah, it's really that's really good. That's fantastic. That's really good. Um, he's not going to have to play in the ninth this year. Last year in the ninth, a 3.8 ERA, nine earned runs in 21 and a third. Not terrible, but not as good as him in the eighth. So with him in the eighth, I'll stick with Yenyu Cano. Yeah, I think that's an excellent pick. Maybe a little chalky, just like it the round of 32. It is a little chalky, but it's also right. The round of 32 was was chalky here it in March was, Madness, man. so... Yenier Cano, a good chalky pick. I'm going to go with maybe like an 11-6 upset here. Wow. I'm going to take Dylan Tate as the lowest reliever ERA. And here is my reasoning. The last time we saw Dylan Tate, his ERA was down at 305. That was a worse bullpen two years ago. Dylan Tate was really one of the only well-established relievers in that pen. And now Dylan Tate joins a bullpen with guys like Craig Kimbrell, with Daniel Cano, Danny Coulomb, Cino Perez, a bunch of guys that are going to take the pressure off of him a little bit. And so in my estimation, you're probably not going to see Dylan Tate in the ninth inning very much. I think if you need a backup closer option behind Kimbrell, it's probably Cano, as you mentioned. So I think we could see Dylan Tate in the sixth, seventh, eighth inning of ball games. And Brandon Hyde is going to be able to use him in a lot more situations that are just really favorable for Dylan Tate. Not just, you know, throw him in in the eighth, ninth inning because you don't have a lot of other bullpen pieces you can move around. You can move these guys around. Yeah. And I think Dylan Tate now in a much improved bullpen is going to have the chance to really thrive in his situations. And his situations are when there are three right-handers coming up yeah. and he can get them all out. So I'm going to go with Dylan Tate. I, I think an improved bullpen is really going to help with his numbers and getting him in a better spot to really, really get outs effectively. I hope you're right because it's fun to watch him dominate righties. Yeah. It's just fun to watch that guy pitch when he's pitching really well. Yeah. Uh, and I think Dylan Tate's addition to this team is going to be huge. You know, missing out on him last year was a was a pretty big loss. Like you said, a 3.05 ERA in the bullpen is not easy to replace when he's throwing that many innings. Uh, so if he comes back and pitches as well as we think he might, I think that the Orioles are going to be hugely benefited by his arm. Yeah, one of the best sinkers in baseball. Yeah, Had a run value of 21 on his sinker in 2022, which was the best of the game. That's pretty crazy. So Dylan Tate gets my boat. I wonder there. how many people would guess that. That's a great trivia question. That's, it. That's what I do. You're on the bird's <laughs> nest. I give out good trivia questions. Next category here. Most home runs. Okay. Uh, Who's hitting the boomstick the most for you? So I didn't go with, uh, you know, I didn't go with your Hendersons. I didn't go with your Santanders. Wow. I went with a man named Ryan Mountcastle. Okay. And the reason I did is because when he came back from his Vertigo IL stint last year, which was from June 8th to July 9th, he missed a month. When he came back... He was electric, okay? He was. He only played 115 games last year in which he hit 18 home runs. Uh, the guy, when he came back from the Vertigo stint, a 326 average, seven homers, 29 RBI, and an OPS right next to 900. A fantastic hitter, Ryan Mountcastle. And in 2021, we saw him hit 33 home runs. I think he, every single season, has the potential to hit 30-plus home runs. Yeah. Th that's just the kind of hitter that he is. He's a big dude, and he's got a great bat from the right side. I love watching this guy hit when he's on. I love his weird stance. I just, I love watching that guy hit. And yeah. I think he, due to the nature of the talent that's been added to the roster and his injury status last year, has sort of become a little bit underrated. Sure. If you're looking peripherally from a casual fan or a fan of another team, you're not thinking about Ryan Mountcastle as much as you're thinking about Gunnar Henderson due to his huge year or Adley or Santander. Right now, you're not. Sure. So I think that he's a little bit of a dark horse candidate, but at the same time, we all know he has that power, so I'm going with Ryan Mountcastle. Yeah, I think that's a, a solid pick there with Ryan Mountcastle. You mentioned his numbers were drastically improved after yeah. his IL stint last year. His on-base percentage, that's not hitting home runs most of the time, but his on-base percentage was drastically improved, which is huge. The only thing with Ryan Mountcastle is where he plays home games. Yeah. He's a right-handed hitter at Oriole Park at Camden Yards. That's true. And that wall is there. That's somebody, why somebody asked Ryan Mountcastle the other day if he had like found peace with the wall, <laughs> and Mountcastle was like, "Well, it's there." <laughs> so, so Ryan Mountcastle, we know he has a ton of power from the right hand side, 
Hopefully he hits a lot of pull side homers at road ballparks because you know it's funny? hard to do here. What's funny about the wall to me is when a guy hits a home run to the left side, I think I saw Adley do it a few times last year, and it goes in the first row. You're like, oh, yeah. it's first row home run. Then you think about it, you're like, that's a bomb. <laughs> that's a bomb of a home run. <laughs> that was a tank. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to go with Gunnar Henderson. A, a little bit chalky here, but he had 28 home runs last season, which was tied with Anthony Santander. Adley was the next closest with 20. So Gunner and Santander, if you're looking at the stats from last year, are the two that are kind of the runaway favorites here. Santander had 30-ish more plate appearances, and Gunner at the end of the year really started to pick things up in left-on-left -left situations. He wasn't getting platooned for. Gunner Henderson was going to be in the game no matter who was pitching, and he showed at the end of last year that he could hit home runs off of lefties too. So... I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a 30-plus homer season from Gunnar Henderson, a Corey Seager-esque type of bat from the left side of the plate, and we have seen Corey Seager demonstrate that kind of power over his career, and I think Gunnar Henderson has the same sort of capability. Corey Seager in back-to-back -back years, 33 home runs. I think Gunnar Henderson could be right there. I'm so excited for his season this year. Yeah. I cannot wait to watch Gunnar Henderson play baseball this season. I mean, this is a guy who, like you said, has that Corey Seager ceiling. Yeah. And, you know, he has the potential to maybe even be better than Corey Seager. I just think athletically, Hello? I think he does. You don't think so? No, I, I certainly. I think he has that potential. I'm not saying he is right now. I'm just saying he could be one day. Um, he's incredibly the ceiling athletic. is the roof. Yeah. You know? right. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. Um, I just think he's such a fantastic player, and his power numbers, like you said, you know, the ceiling is the roof. The ceiling. You can just keep going. The ceiling really so is the roof. I'm excited to watch him this year, and I think you're right. I mean, he's got that pop, and hitting from the left side at this stadium is pretty fun, so I'm excited to watch him. We've got a bunch more categories to run through. Let's get through them. Highest OPS. I'm going to go with Adley here. Adley had an 809 OPS last year. Gunner was up at an 814. I think the slugging percentage for Adley Runchman is going to improve. We didn't see a ton of power from him last year. I say we didn't see a ton. He still had 20 homers and 31 doubles, which is a fantastic, fantastic season. But the slugging percentage was down at 435. I could see that creeping up to maybe 460, 470 for Adley Runchman this year. What really sets him apart is the on-base percentage. He had 92 walks last season. The next highest on the Orioles was Gunnar Henderson with 56 walks. Yep. So if Adley gets the power numbers up even a little bit, if we see him hit 23, 24 home runs, 35 doubles instead of 31, the on-base percentage is really going to set him apart, and the OPS could be up 850, 900. I have the same exact thinking. I think it'll be Adley. Uh, and 20 home runs for a catcher is obviously unbelievable, and like you, I think he can hit even more. Yeah. Uh, and I think those doubles numbers could go up as well. So I've got him both, you know, leading the team in walks, like you said, 92 next to Gunners, 56 is pretty impressive. Uh, and I think those power numbers are power numbers will increase. So I'll take Adley too. How about the most stolen bases? This one's interesting. Yeah. This one's this one is between, I think, Mateo and Mullins. Sure. Um, and I'm gonna go Mullins here because yeah. I just think one in a full season, he'll hit 30. He'll get to that oh, 30 yeah. number. And I don't know what playing time is going to look like for Jorge Mateo. So that's where the competition might stifle a little bit and Mullins might run away with it. I mean, Mullins had 19 bases in 116 games last year. And that same allotment of games, Mateo had 32. Um, so there's that. But I think in a full season, Mullins does hit 30. Yeah, I've got the same thinking. I, I go with Cedric Mullins here. Mateo did lead the team with 32 as you mentioned, but I don't think he's going to get as many opportunities this season. That being said, if Jorge Mateo is a pinch runner, he might just be on first and steal immediately. Yeah. So he might not need to start that many games to just come in in the eighth inning, be a pinch runner, steal second base, That's true. get something going. He might be like a designated stealer at some point in this season because Jorge Mateo is that fast and that Terrence good at Gore stealing type? bases. Terrence Gore type, maybe. But Jorge Mateo, I, again, I think he's going to get some more playing time he's than Terrence Gore did. Than Terrence Gore. Cedric Mullins did steal 34 bases in 2022. He's going to be the everyday center fielder when he's healthy. Hoping for a full, healthy season from Cedric Mullins, I think he could lead this team in steals. Next one's probably going to be a little bit chalky, but I do want to talk about some other guys as well. Most impactful promotion. We're probably in agreement that it's going to be the number one overall prospect in baseball. That's who I've got. 
in Jackson Holiday. Good, good takes from us there. <laughs> but look, you still got Kobe Mayo, Connor Norby, Chase McDermott, I think are candidates there as well. Heston Kerstad, if we're counting him as a promotion for this season, he'll get promoted he still at some has point. His prospect status. Yeah, he, he will get his big league reps at some point, surely, in 2024. So he is going to be a big impact as well. Most impactful is, is going to be the best prospect in baseball. I think so. Yeah. I think so. Um, I, I can't wait to see Kobe Mayo play at the stadium. I just, I, I'm really excited for what Kobe Mayo could do here. And um, obviously, we don't know when he'll be promoted. Uh, it could be after an injury. It could just be such and such. I don't know. Couldn't tell you at all, but he's a promotion I'm really excited about. Yeah, Kobe Mayo has the type of power to make that left field wall look pretty small. Yeah, which not a lot of guys do. I feel like if you have that power and you could play decent defense, you're probably a major leaguer. Yeah, Mayo and Mounty have that kind of power. All right, a couple of categories here. Needed to add in some fun ones before we get to yearly awards and most valuable Oriole and who we think is going to win the division. Let's go with best hair on the team. Okay. I think the leading candidate has got to be Dean Kramer. I have a question. Because he has got some flow. Yes. Do facial hair count? That was what I was going to bring up. Okay. I think Colton Gowser, if he keeps growing out the beard, and if the mustache gets like even more handlebar, Colton Gowser could be up there. Colton Gowser might be my favorite player in baseball if he keeps <laughs> that beard. <laughs> yeah, I, I just love his beard. It's 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 huge now. It's great. Like it's almost to Mike Napoli levels of beard. Like it's, it's glorious. It's a large beard. Yeah. Um. Almost Jabba Chamberlain on the Tigers kind of beard. And I have a feeling, too, that if somebody like Jordan Westberg went up to Colton Kowser and was like, I will give you five American dollars to grow out the most ridiculous handlebar mustache you've ever seen, Colton would be like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> I got to ask him about that beard, man. Because he's just that guy. He said, like, they were telling him not to trip on the orange carpet for opening day. And he was like, I don't know. But if somebody like thought it would be a funny bit, like I'd do it. <laughs> like, yeah, man, that's how Colton Gowser rolls. But Gowser is up there with the beard stash combo. Pick. Corbin Burns, I think is a sneaky one too. I think yeah. he might be bringing back the, the Milwaukee flow okay. a little bit, had short hair last year, but he's up there. Adley and Gunner have an excellent flow going Gunner's as well. Hair, or, excuse me, Adley's hair is looking pretty good. Yeah. He's, I saw it yesterday and I was like, wow, he's really growing that he's, thing He's out. growing it out. Gunnar Henderson's hair. Gunner, Gunner's the, the clubhouse leader pretty much always. I mean, Gunner's hair, his rookie season when he first got promoted was so glorious that he could not keep a helmet on yes. when he hit his first home run. And so. I mean, everyone was going nuts over his hair at that point. I think I'm going to go Dean Kramer still for hair, okay. but Kowser and his facial hair is up there. I'm going Colton. Here's one for you, Bones. Okay. How about biggest bromance? All right. Best pals on the team. What if I instead <laughs> made a... What if I took your category and changed it? Because your category is now, dumb. I'll go through your category real quick. The problem is, I got to be honest, like, I'm not in there enough to see who's talking all the time. You know, I want to know They're what the most... Up. I want to know what the most obscure, unexpected friendship on the team is. And you know what? I'm going to quest to find out. Sure. Uh, I want to know what, who it is. I might ask some guys, what do you think is the most unexpected friendship on this team? I, wa I yeah. want to know that Felix Bautista and James McCann are going to lunch every weekend. Sure. Like, I mean, I guess they're pitcher and catcher, so that's definitely plausible. But, like, yeah. how about CNL Perez and Tony Kemp? Maybe sure. they're best friends. Well, like, how about Cole know. Irvin and Tony Kemp? That's true. A couple of Oakland yeah, A's, A's teammates. There you go. Yeah. Cole Irvin was pumped to have Tony Kemp in the clubhouse yesterday. Said he was a great guy. Great addition to the clubhouse. I think the leaders for biggest bromance, I mean, Gunner and Kowser are up there for yeah. sure. They've got their Lego building competition. Adley and Grayson, Adley and Gunner. Adley and everybody, man. Adley and everybody, really. He, he's a Adley catalyst. and anybody that he hugs. Yeah, he's, he's just a, a catalyst of, of joy and sunshine in that clubhouse is Adley Rutschman. Sure. I, I think there's a lot of candidates there because it's a great clubhouse. A lot of those guys are really close friends. Don't sleep on, you know, Jordan Westberg and... Somebody there, I like Jordan Westbrook's pals with everybody. Yeah, so. uh, you know Danny Coulomb and anybody. Danny Coulomb and anybody. That guy loves to talk. Yeah, he loves to hang out and, and razz anybody that's in there. Yeah. Last, uh, last of the fun ones here. Who's gonna win that Lego building competition between Colton Kowser and Gunnar Henderson? I mean, I think you gotta take Kowser. Right. Right. Like I, I, mean, I think this I'm is an experienced Kowser. Lego builder. Right. When you look at his resume, I mean, he's been doing it for a long time, and I don't yeah. really know if Gunner has. He might be. Who knows? Well, yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't know about his Lego building career, but 
I got to take Cowser here. I mean, he just seems like the more. Um, he talks about it more for yeah, sure. Yeah, like he just seems he's more verified builder. Yeah. I'm going to lean Cowser as well just because the first time we heard about the Lego building was a conversation with Colton Cowser and John Rhodes back in, I think, Double A Bowie. Shout out to John Rhodes. We heard about that. Paul Mancano right and here. I were down there talking about Legos with John Rhodes and Colton Cowser, and that was the first we learned about Cowser's Lego building expertise. So you're right. Just because I know the track record, I'm probably going to lean Cowser, but... I, I think might surprise you. I, look, when you're talking about big league baseball players, those guys are all so competitive that I wouldn't be surprised if even something like a Lego building competition, just like there's a little bit of competitiveness. Yeah, I don't think Gunner's taking it off. No. I think this is a serious thing for him. This too. is a big thing. Yeah. Yeah, they're not even ready to reveal what the competition is, what they bought to compete to build this season, but we're excited to see it. Yep. And it's going to be fun. All right, let's go to the big yearly look backs here we'll start with the al east who do you have winning that division and why i think it'll be the orioles i actually really do and i'm not just saying that because i'm on the bird's nest inside the the warehouse at oriole park at camden yards i really do think it'll be the orioles more yeah. because i think the al east is more wide open than people think it is the yankees i i mean i really don't feel good about the Yankees' chances right now. I just don't think that with their injuries and a lot of question marks on that team, I don't feel like they're going to run the division. Uh, and they didn't do that last year. In 2022, they were very good, but the wheels fell off at the end. I don't think that they're going to come out and dominate this division. Uh, the Blue Jays, another team that lost a lot in this offseason and didn't exactly... I mean, they got Isaiah kiner falefa um, they're hoping for a good year from Dalton Varsho. They need a big year from Vladimir Guerrero, who took a bit of a step back last year, and we don't know what's going to happen to Alec Manoa. I don't feel great about the Blue Jays' chances either. The Red Sox, I, I don't even know what they're doing over there. I really have no idea what they're doing. And they've got Brian Bello on the Bayo, excuse me, on the mound, who actually is a good player, I think. Yeah. But I mean, they've got Sedane Raffaella, which Red Sox fans should be excited about. I think a young prospect who's solid. Jaron Duran is good in that outfield. That's all well and good, but I just don't feel like there's a lot on that team that's going to compete with the Orioles' talent. Sure. And then you've got the Rays, who make it up as they go along every season, yeah. and they figure it out. But I think that might be catching up to them. You know, I don't feel, this season, I don't feel as uh, threatened by the Rays as I have in years past. But I feel they like don't have McLaren that every or year. Springs, right? Sure. So, I mean, what's that? And uh, Shane Baz is hurt as well, isn't he? Yeah, I was getting yeah. him and Taj Bradley. Yeah, I mean, it's it's Shane Baz, Taj Bradley, Shane McClanahan, Drew Mas Rasmussen, Jeffrey Springs are all injured to start So the what season. am I supposed, how am I supposed like, to be afraid of them? Because it's the Rays, and they figure out a way to do it. I just don't think they're going to be, I don't think they're going to be a bad team. They'll probably be at least 500, but your offense, I mean, Isak Paredes, I don't know if he's going to do that again. Yeah. Yandy Diaz is a very good player, but you see your best offensive player. You've got Randy Rosarena as well, of course, but... I just, I'm not that threatened by the Rays. I think that the Orioles are in the best position to win this division. I think that the other teams, it's going to come down to whose question marks turn into check marks. Sure. So we'll see. But I think the O's have the most solidified talent going into the season for sure. Yeah, that was a good run down there. I'm going to go with the Orioles as well. And again, not just because we're on the bird's nest here, but as you mentioned, the Yankees, I feel very different about without Garrett Cole. Yeah. I, they've got it's great that they have Juan Soto. That's great for your it's offense. A very, it's a very top-heavy team who's with Aaron for that Judge team? and Juan Soto and Garrett Cole, and you lose one of those superstars, and now all of a sudden there's a lot of questioning marks in the pitching rotation. I am concerned about the Yankees. The Blue Jays look good on paper. We said that last year. They looked better on paper last year and did not win the AL East. The Rays are always scary. Yeah, I, The Rays are the one team that I probably would have gone with to win this division had it not been the Orioles. I think they are going to push the Orioles once again. I know the pitching staff has injuries, but also at the beginning of last year, we weren't talking about Rasmussen and Springs as guys that you would really, really miss if they were down for an extended period of time in this pitching staff. And now we're talking about them as huge losses, which makes me wonder who's going to be in this pitching staff that is now going to be more important than ever. 
Zach Eflin, they gave a, a relatively sizable contract to, and everyone was like, huh? They made a big trade. And then he looked Kyle like an Manzardo. ace last yeah. year. So the Rays are going to scare you. The Red Sox don't scare me, really. As you mentioned, on paper, you never know. But on paper, they don't look up to the caliber of the rest of the AL East. The Rays do scare me, though. So if there is one team that I am looking at as the Orioles' toughest competition to repeat as AL East champions here, it's the Tampa Bay Rays. I feel like the Orioles just got to go out and play their game, and it'll be all okay. Yeah, I really, I don't even think they're going to have to have to, you know, win a hundred games to win this division. No, I really don't. So, but still, I mean, it's the AL East. You might have to win ninety-five. No, oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, go nuts. Go nuts. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's talk in general yearly awards okay. for Major League Baseball. Do you see any Orioles winning MVP, winning Cy Young, winning Rookie of the Year? I think that manager of the year, executive of the year. I think that they have candidates in every single they sure one do. of those categories. They sure do. Adley and Gunner both have chances to make the to win MVP this year. Yep. Um, I think Gunner, like we've talked about, with his power, athleticism, and defense, he absolutely could win MVP this season. Um, just a guy who is on a meteoric rise. I mean, his talent is so darn good. Uh, he could go out and, and be compared to anybody and have a good shot at being better. And no Shohei in the American League. Correct. Which is nice. Yeah, it's like Michael Jordan's out of the East, finally. Right. Um, but I'll go, I mean, Adley also, I think, ha has a great chance. You know, this is a guy who is now one of the best, if not the best catcher in baseball. Yep. And when you're, I mean, we've seen it historically. Catchers, I think, the bar for MVP is a little bit lower for them just because it is so difficult to be an offensive-minded catcher, right? I mean, we just don't see it all that often. Mauer, Posey are the only two who really stick out. Salvador Perez as well. And yeah. two out of the three of those guys did win MVPs. Yeah, Posey so, was the last catcher to win in 2012. Yeah, so, I mean, I think Adley could be the next catcher to win MVP absolutely 100%. With a healthy season this year, and if he continues to do what he does at the plate and you know, enhances it a little bit this season and gets those power numbers up like we talked about, those doubles numbers and those home run numbers up, I think he could absolutely be up for that award. I mean, how often do you see a switch hitting catcher with that amount of offensive talent be that good at managing a staff? You know, yeah. all things considered, he is absolutely fantastic and everything the Orioles hoped for when they drafted him one overall. Yeah, I've got Gunnar Henderson and Adley Rutschman right up there in American League MVP. I'm not going to say that either one of them are going to win it, yeah. but I think both of them have very strong cases. I do have Corbin Burns winning American League Cy Young. Wow. Garrett Cole, Garrett Cole, that, that path looking money there, the path to American League Cy Young feels clear with no Garrett Cole because outside of Cole, you're looking at Kevin Gossman, Framber Valdez, Tarek Skubal, Cole Reagans. That's the other guys that, I would view as potential American League Cy Young candidates. And Corbin Burns is the best pitcher out of that group. I, I think he could I win think Cy he Young. Is as well, but I think that Kevin Gosman's on like a rampage right now. Could be. I think Corbin Burns might go out there and have like a 2008 CC Sabathia kind of season where you just lock down. I mean, you're there and you just absolutely dominate hitters. Yeah. But... I also think Kevin Gosman's going to be a real obstacle. Cole being out helps. Absolutely, that helps. I mean, you're probably taking him out of the conversation entirely if he's going to miss multiple months. I mean, those players just don't really become comparable with that gap of innings. Yeah. Um, I think Burns, like you said, is definitely the best talent available right now in the AL. I think he's the most talented pitcher that the league has to offer. I think Scooble is really good. Scooble's um, really good. And he's on the rise right now in Detroit. He's a really, really good pitcher. I think it'll be, while it is more wide open with Cole being out, I think it'll be an exciting race to see all five of those names, uh, four or five of those names in there. I mean, Cole Reagans is going to be exciting in Kansas City as well, yep. like you mentioned. Framber Valdez is so talented. It's going to be pretty fun to watch. Yeah, I think they're all up there. I think Jackson Holiday is going to be up for Rookie of the Year as well. It's yeah. going to depend on when he gets promoted. You've got guys like Evan Carter, Wyatt Langford in Texas that are going to be up for that as well. But I think Jackson Holiday has a real shot. One more fun one before we get to our final category of most valuable Oriole. How about our hottest take for the season? I'll start with one here that I've got. 
I don't think it's going to happen, which is why it's my hottest take. But just throwing it out there. I think we could see Enrique Bradfield Jr. in September. That's an insane take. I think it's an insane take, but hear me out. Enrique Bradfield Jr. has 80-grade speed, and he has 80-grade defense Yeah, in center field. I don't think Enrique Bradfield Jr. is going to come up in September and be you know, an impact, you're starting in center field type of player. But Enrique Bradfield Jr. is so fast to the point where you don't want to take him out of getting reps. Let's say at the end of the year, Enrique Bradfield Jr. is in, you know, maybe he's in triple A if he has a really good season at the plate in single A and in double A. Maybe he's at triple A Norfolk. You don't want to take him out of games there. But let's just say there's a scenario where Enrique Bradfield Jr. gets to the end of the season, has been hitting relatively well, and has stolen, I don't know, 150 bases down in the minor leagues. I think the Orioles could at least be tempted to call up Enrique Bradfield Jr. for a playoff push and say, you're just going to pinch run every ninth inning. You're going to steal second. You're going to steal third. You're going to put us in a good position to win baseball games. So in that situation, he'd have to be on the 40-man by September 1st. Yeah, it, yeah? It, there's a reason it's my hottest take because it's not going to happen. But what if it did? That would be, that'd <laughs> that would be something. Be, you know, that that would it's interesting to think about because you do need that guy. Some well, you don't need him, but it, it's been proven yeah. that that kind of player is valuable Jorge in the postseason. Jorge Mateo is kind of that guy. Yes, that's the thing I was going to say. Is Jorge Mateo yeah. kind of already fills that like, role if, for you. Enrique Bradfield Jr. could come up in a few years and steal like 80 bases. He has yeah. that kind of speed. The dude's a menace on the base paths. Getting to watch him in Del Marva for one of the games that I was down there after he was drafted, it was literally, he gets on first, steals second, steals third. I was half convinced he was going to steal home. <laughs> I mean, he's ridiculously fast. Yeah, he is quite fast. Yeah, it's outlandish. His his eighty grade defense is the like is the part that's crazy to me. Oh like, yeah, a lot of guys maybe aren't that fast, but are incredibly fast. But not a lot of guys are that fast and can play incredible defense. Yeah, he's he's a stud. Bones, hit me with player. your hottest take. My hottest take, I think, is that Craig Kimbrell is going to have one of the best seasons of his career. Wow. Um, I think a lot it's a of people, Hall of Fame type career yes, that we're talking about. I think here. he's going to, I think last year in the postseason, not everybody was happy about him. I was admittedly a little questioning his, his you know, whether or not he was going to come and make in the impact that we've seen him make in the past. But since I saw that change up that he threw to Bryson yeah. Stott. Yeah, I'm all in. If you on haven't the Craig seen Kimbrell the video train. of Bryson Stott, because he Craig can't believe Kimbrell what just came at him. Does not throw a changeup. He throws up. two pitches. He throws two pitches. He throws fastball and he throws a knuckle curve. Yeah. And then Craig Kimbrell threw a changeup in spring training. And it was unbelievable. And Bryson Stott leaves the box and says, "What the word we can't say on this show <laughs> was that? Was that? Yeah. Because how did Craig Kimbrell, after this Hall of Fame career, just to go? Yeah, I'm gonna throw a changeup. That's up. what Hall of Famers do. That's they adapt." Hilarious. And I think that Craig Kimbrell is going to come in and, you know, shock the league when he starts throwing a crazy changeup. Yeah. No, so I'm happy with... Uh, I can get behind that take yeah, with Craig Kimbrell's changeup. My hottest take. I can that. certainly see it. Let's get to our final category here of most valuable Oriole. Okay. I think there are a bunch of prime candidates here. You have a Cy Young caliber pitcher in Corbin Burns. You have a couple of, as we mentioned, MVP candidates in Adley Rutschman and in Gunnar Henderson, you have a Hall of Famer potentially in Craig Kimbrell at the back end of your bullpen that could be up there for most valuable Oriole as well. I think I'm going to go with Adley Rutschman. Dang here. it. We are both anticipating that he is going to lead this team in OPS. And if that's the case, if he is one of your two or three best hitters on this team and brings you elite defense once again, catching a pitching staff that could be one of the best in all of baseball with an ace in Corbin Burns, with Kyle Bradish and John Means coming back, Grayson Rodriguez, who we expect to take a huge jump in 2024. If Adley is giving you, let's say, an 830, 840, 850 OPS and playing elite defense behind the dish, I think it would be hard not to make the case for him for most valuable Oriole. Here's the other thing. He is... The leader of this team, I think. You know, it does. I mean, it does certainly feel it feels that way. that way, yeah, doesn't it? And I think that if the Orioles are able to go on another great run as they did last season and win 
a ton of games and make the playoffs, it's going to be hard not to look to him and say, wow, I mean, could they have done this without the leadership of a guy like that? Yeah, I mean, the impact that he has on the lineup is immense as somebody yeah. who could, you know, I mean, we saw him as the leadoff hitter, as yes. the catcher, because he just gets on base that frequently. He sees pitches so well. The impact that he has on the pitching staff yeah. is immense, working with those guys day in and day out. So not only could he potentially put up the best numbers, but his impact is just felt across the board. And the numbers are nice. I, I think that uh, obviously you need those if you're going to win an award like sure. MVO. But uh, I think it's his leadership capabilities um, that will keep him at the top of that list for me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there are our predictions for the 2024 season. We are just 24 hours away from baseball. Baseball. That's it's funny. happening. It is here, happening, like it does every year. At Oriole Park at Camden Yards. Yep. The Orioles are opening up here. We're going to see Corbin Burns on the mound for the first time at Camden Yards in an Orioles uniform. That's going to be really cool. The opening day lineup is going to be really good because this is a really good team that just won 101 games, won the AL East, and they've got unfinished business after falling short in the playoffs. You could feel it from conversations with players with Brandon Hyde. They went into spring training and they meant business because they knew that this is a good team coming in this year and they don't want to go winless in the playoffs again. This is a different mentality heading into 2024 and it's going to be exciting and it all gets started tomorrow here at Camden Yards. Make sure you're tuning into Masson one hour before game time tomorrow at two o'clock. There will be a special one hour pregame show with opening ceremonies and all that good stuff. Make sure you're following along with us on our Mass and Orioles social pages. We're going to have you covered for everything opening day related this weekend. And if you didn't catch us live today on YouTube and Facebook, make sure you catch the Bird's Nest after the fact on Spotify, SoundCloud, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts or digital shows, you can catch us on the Bird's Nest. Big thank you to Amy Jennings behind the scenes for producing this one. He is Matt Bonaparte. I'm Brendan Mortensen. We'll see you for opening day.